Massachusetts, Mark from the United States. Good morning, good afternoon, good evening, Mark from the States. How are we doing today? I am doing fantastic. I hope you are as well. Thank you so much for coming. I appreciate each and every one of you. You guys are truly amazing. Thanks for coming back. Today, we're going to visit with the History Chap. Please go and support him. He is so amazing. Chris does such a great job. I was lucky enough to get it, uh, get to watch his uh, live live stream thing on Friday. Uh, I got normally I'm just not able to uh, visit, but uh, I got to see him do his thing on Friday, which was really cool. Um, please join his uh, email newsletter, sends you out emails to let you know what's coming up, gives you the this week in history kind of thing. And that's what he was talking about on Friday. So it was a lot of fun. Um, saw a lot of people on there that I recognized. Um, so it was really cool. Um, today we're going to learn the real story of the Cockershell Heroes. Now, we, I've done a video on, the, on this, I think, many uh, months ago, long time ago. And so I kind of already have a, an idea what it is. Uh, I haven't seen the movie. Uh, I hear it's pretty good. Um, of course, if I had all the time in the world, I could sit and sit and watch movies. I would totally watch, but uh, it's tough to... Uh, even get the two-hour break, even though I find myself sitting on the couch while watching sports for two more than two hours. So you'd think I would have the time. I just, I think, <laughs> I just gotta be <laughs> prioritizing, I guess, a little differently. Um, come, let's hear the real story. Chris is gonna share with us. Uh, please go support his channel. The link to this video and to his uh, channel will be in the description, as always. Uh, see this thing right here behind me that I'm uh, sitting on, I guess? Uh, it's big. It's fake. It's the couch that we can all fit on. So please come with me. We're going to enjoy this. This is going to be great. And hopefully I, well, obviously I'm going to learn something new today. But hopefully maybe you get something out of it that you didn't know about before. And uh, yeah, win-win for everybody. So let's do it. This is the real story of the Cockershell Heroes. I was discussing the war film, The Cockle Shell Heroes, recently with some blokes after one of my live talks. The conversation turned to whether it was based upon real events, and if so, how close was the film to the truth? So, I decided to do a little bit of research, and here's what I've found. Released in 1955, The Cockle Shell Heroes starred Trevor Howard, Christopher Lee, David Lodge and Anthony Newley, and tells the story of a daring raid by British commandos in kayaks who plant mines on some German ships. It was actually based upon a real historic event during World War II, Operation Frankton, when British commandos conducted a daring sabotage attack on German ships in the French port of Bordeaux. The main role in the Cockleshell Heroes was taken by José Ferrer, who also directed the film. <laughs> Incidentally, he's the uncle to actor George Clooney. Hmm. Ferrer, who had starred in the Kane Mutiny the previous year, played the commander of the raid, Major Stringer. Although, that's not the name of the commander in the actual raid. In fact, the names of all the characters in the film were changed from the real events. And whilst it's a great action film with some great characters, the real events and the real Cockleshell heroes are even more inspiring than the film. This is the real story of the Cockleshell heroes in World War II. Alright, let me be honest, it might not be my absolute favourite World War II film. I'm going to let him get into that, we'll go back so he can say, explain. Um, but out of the actors that he mentioned, Trevor Howard, of course, I, I the name, he's done a ton of World War II movies, right? Um, uh, of course, Christopher Lee, he was in a ton of stuff that I've seen. Uh, wasn't he in um, Lord of the Rings as well, among other films so many uh so he's probably the most known at for to me that i would recognize by i couldn't i don't think i could recognize trevor howard if you were to show me a picture of i don't know if i would instantly recognize him but uh the name i know he's done a ton um but and then the other guys they did not sound familiar um this it's I love the fact that, you know, we have the war, 
World War II. But it's, you know, when we think of World War II, we kind of think of the whole thing, but it's so many different little snippets in time, little, all these little different parts to it that you could literally do movie after movie after movie after all these little daring raids or missions and just acts of heroism, you know, bravery, incredible, hard to believe situations, things that by chance happen, you know, near misses, tragedy. I mean, it goes on and on and on, even love stories. So, uh, I mean, war is bad. War is awful. But uh, (laughs) the cats are having a disagreement right there. Um, But there's so many stories that are just incredible that come out of such horrible things. This being one of them. Um, So I'm looking forward to this. To be honest, it might not be my absolute favorite World War II film. After all, there are so many other contenders. For instance, The Longest Day, The Battle of Britain, Bridge Bridge Too Far. But The Cockle Shell Heroes is definitely up there. But I'm interested in what your favorite Second World War film is. Drop me a line in the comments below. And you never know, I might even make a video about the most popular one or ones. Uh, Anyway, back to the real event depicted in the film, Operation Frankton. Five Cockle Mark II kayaks, each crewed by two commandos, were launched from a British submarine in the dead of night in December 1942. And over the next four days, they paddled nearly 80 miles up the tidal Gironde River to Bordeaux. Eight, zero, 80 miles? Holy shite. That is incredible. I don't remember knowing that fact. That is a long, long way. In a kayak? Oh my gosh. Oh, only two crews reached the destination. Only two? Where they planted limpet mines on five five German freight vessels and a German naval patrol boat. Following the attack, they attempted to reach neutral Spain and from there, the British colony of Gibraltar. Only one crew made it. Of the rest, two died from hypothermia when their kayak capsized, and six were executed by the Germans following an order from Hitler. The real commander was Maverick Royal Marine Officer Captain Herbert Blondie Hasler. 28-year-old Hasler was four years younger than Ferrer when he played the lead role in the film. He was born in Dublin in 1914, whilst his father, a British Army officer, was stationed there. His father was to die during the First World War when his troop ship was torpedoed. Herbert George Hasler was a born adventurer with a love for boats. While still at school, he had built his first canoe following instructions in the boy's own paper. That guy looks like a commando. He just has that look of commando material. (laughs) Just has that look. That's Hasler. Hmm. This paper come magazine, which contained stories of adventure and sport, along with survival skills and competitions, Bear was published for nearly 100 years time. until 1967. <laughs> <laughs> now, I can't let this opportunity pass. Did you read Boy's Own? Or if not, what comic or magazine did you read when you were growing up? Where in, in England is there bear hunting going on at this time? Or are they, or was this also, um, uh, including like say Canada? It's an interesting headline there: bear hunting in winter time. It's in quotes, so I'm not quite sure what that means. <laughs> if it's what it means, where? Where would you? I wonder if. Uh, I'm probably spending way too much time on this. Nicknamed Blondie, Hasler was commissioned in the Royal Marines in 1932. In the early days of the Second World War, he participated in the Norwegian campaign in 1940, where he served alongside a detachment from the French Foreign Legion. For his actions in Norway, he was awarded the OBE, as well as the French Croix de Guerre. 
On his return to Britain, he lobbied the Admiralty with his idea of using canoes to attack enemy ships in harbours. <laughs> but his ideas were dismissed as a bit too boy's own for their liking. <laughs> However, Britain's enemies were to come to his, or rather his plans, rescue. In the spring of 1941, the Italians had used explosive motorboats to attack British ships lying oh, at anchor off okay. the Greek island of Crete. The attack sunk a Norwegian tanker and severely damaged a Royal Navy heavy cruiser, HMS York. In December 1941, they struck again. This time, manning tiny craft nicknamed human torpedoes, they damaged HMS Queen Elizabeth and HMS Valiant at Alexandria in Egypt. Was... Admiral Lord Louis Mountbatten, Chief of Combined Operations, came under pressure from British Prime Minister Winston Churchill to strike back in a similar fashion. And suddenly, Hasler's madcap scheme was not go. so bonkers after all. <laughs> he was posted to the Combined Operations Development Centre on the Solent, where he was placed in command of several captured Italian motorboats. In an effort to deceive the enemy, it was announced that these were boom patrol boats, whose purpose was to protect Portsmouth Harbour. And thus, the Royal Marine Boom Patrol Detachment was born. It would be the nucleus for the Special Boat Service after the war. Despite the Royal Navy's best efforts to blockade the German-held ports on the western coastline of Europe, some German blockade busters had managed to get through. One of the centres of this blockade busting was the French port at Bordeaux. Over 70 miles up the Chiron River, it was too well protected and inland for a standard Royal Navy attack. Not a textbook Navy attack? That was just what Maverick Hasler was after. He did, however, face a problem. The Italian boats, while smaller than a Royal Navy destroyer or even a frigate, would be easily spotted travelling the 70 plus miles up the sure. Huron and sure. would be destroyed long before they reached Bordeaux. It needed something altogether more subtle and dangerous. Hasler's idea of attacking German shipping using canoes was dusted off and Operation Frankton was on. He planned to carry out the attack using collapsible kayaks based upon the type used by the Inuits of Northern Canada. Okay. It's, it's insane. 80 miles having to row up the river. I'm assuming that's Hasler right there. Um, inc just the, the, the dudes who are doing this are just must have been in incredible shape, strong upper body and arms. To have to row. Oh my gosh, the training must have been insane. That's wild. Hmm. Capable of carrying two men, these canvas sided kayaks were called cockles, or officially, canvas cockle sided. Mark twos, and hence the cockle shell heroes. The Cockle Mark IIs were manufactured at the Saunders and Row or Sarrow works at Cowles on the Isle of Wight. Apart from the two-man crew, these shallow draft cockles were designed to carry about 150 pounds of equipment, including food and clothing for the journey up the Gironde to Bordeaux, a silent stem gun, two grenades, two Colt 45 pistols, and eight limpet mines. The last of those items would be placed on the sides of the German vessels at anchor in the seeming safety of Bordeaux. In October 1942, Hasler's plan was approved by Mountbatten, but the Chief of Combined Operations insisted that six, and not Hasler's intended four, cockle kayaks took part in the raid. Following intense practice on the Swale, which is a tidal channel in the Thames estuary that separates the Isle of Sheppey from mainland Kent, the carefully selected team. I'm sorry, I gotta go back. Insisted that six, and not Hasler's six. intended four, cockle kayaks took part in the raid. So the, he wanted four, they said six. So now we have 12 men. My math is correct. All right, so six boats going up there. Got it. Following intense practice on the Swale, which is a tidal channel in the Thames estuary that separates the Isle of Sheppey from mainland Kent, the carefully selected team from the Royal Marine Boom Patrol Detachment were ready for one of the most daring British commando raids of the Second World War. Some say daring, I say crazy. On the 30th of November, 1942, <laughs> the six two-man cockle crews, plus a reserve member, set sail on a British submarine, HMS Tuna, from Holy Lock in Scotland. Tuna. Tuna had been launched in May 1940, 
and was captained by Lieutenant Commander Dick Rakes. In the film The Cockleshell Heroes, Rakes is renamed Lieutenant Commander Greaves and is played by Christopher Lee. Probably best known for playing Dracula in the Hammer horror films, Lee, who also played Bond villain at Scaramanga in The Man with the Golden Gun, had a fascinating war record in his own oh, that's right. that's right. And maybe I'll tell you his ah. story sometime. As an aside, but thinking of James Rather Bond, wonder. the producer of the Cockleshell Heroes was Cubby Broccoli, who produced all of the 007 films from sure. 1962, Dr. No, right through to the end of the 1980s. The submarine captain had intended to arrive at the mouth of the Gironde on the 6th of December, but adverse weather, and then a minefield, delayed his arrival by 24 hours. It's already Finally, started. <laughs> on the early evening of the 7th of December, HMS Tuna surfaced about 10 miles from the mouth of the French River. Hasler had decided to break his attack into two divisions, three kayaks, all named after sea creatures, in each division. In his own A division, Hasler and Marine Sparks were in the catfish. Along with them would be Corporal Laver and Marine Mills in the crayfish, and Corporal Sherd and Marine Muffet in the conga. Their objective would be to attack enemy ships in the West Dock at Bordeaux. Attacking the East Dock would be B Division, led by Lieutenant McKinnon and Marine Conway in the Cuttlefish, along with Sergeant Wallace and Marine Ewart in the Coolfish, and finally Marines Ellery and Fisher in the Cachalot. Even before the Cockleshell heroes had started out on their mission, disaster struck. As the Cachalot was being manhandled onto the deck of the submarine, its canvas sides were damaged, making it useless. Oh. Marines Ellery and Fisher were forced to look on as the rest of their commando mates gently paddled away from HMS Tuna. Slowly they disappeared into the dark of the winter night. So now we're down to 10. So just like everything, best laid plans, right? So sub delayed by a day, 24 hours because of weather and minefield and so on. Then they rip a boat just loading it on or unloading it or however it you know so you got two guys who are automatically out um and now you're down to 10 so you had two teams of six or two teams of three boats now you have one team that's a boat shy not a good start rakes noted in the ship's log at 8 22 p.m quote Waved au revoir to a magnificent bunch of black-faced villains with whom oh. it's been a real pleasure to work with. End quote. HMS Tuna would go on to destroy three German U-boats during the war. Nice. And Lieutenant Commander Dick Rakes would participate in Operation Deadlight at the end of the war. Here he captained several U-boats as they were towed out to sea to be scuttled. In total, over 100 captured German submarines were sent to the bottom during this post-war operation. Despite their training on the tidal swale in Kent, the tides at the mouth of the Gironde were a new experience. The strong tidal race combined with crosswinds to make the going incredibly hard. Facing those hazards of nature, coalfish disappeared from sight. And then even worse, the conga capsized. Oh, shit. Its occupants, Corporal Sheard and Marine Moffat, had to hold on to the tail of Hasler's cockle, the catfish, in the freezing water. Blondie Hasler now decided to paddle towards the shoreline, before telling the two marines that he was dragging behind him to swim for it and rely on their training and resources and luck to strike out for the Spanish border well over 100 miles to the south. So let's recap. Right. On that opening night and only just entering the mouth of the river, still 70 miles from their target, Hasler's force had already been halved. Paddling as quietly as they could. So we had one guy lost. We don't know what happened to that boat. It just got lost in the in the weather or the wind or it was of course, you know, all the training they did, they they're experiencing nothing that they could replicate back in England. Um so we lost one boat, disappeared. We don't know what happened to it at this point. One capsized, so now we've lost a total of 3 if you count the one that couldn't even set off at the beginning because it got ripped. So now we're down to three, which is one shy of what he really wanted. He wanted just four anyway. So <laughs> I don't know. This is wild. So now we're down to six. Six guys, three boats. Oh, 
the plan was to travel only at night to avoid detection. Whilst decreasing their chances of being spotted, it also meant that their travel time was limited. Moreover, the Gironde was a tidal river. If they paddled with the flood tide, they could cover a fair distance. Uh. But if they were battling against the ebb tide, then it would almost feel like they were paddling through treacle. Resting up in the scrub on the riverbank during the day, it would take an estimated four nights to reach Bordeaux. On that opening night of Operation Frankton, they came across four German patrol boats anchored ahead of them. The cockleshell heroes were forced to silently paddle past them whilst lying on their backs. Oh my gosh. Catfish and crayfish managed the manoeuvre, but they lost contact with Lieutenant McKinnon and Marine Conway in the cuttlefish. At 6.30am, the two remaining cockle Mark so now II we're down to two pulled onto the riverbank to rest. Carefully using the reeds to camouflage their boats, the four men, Hasler, Corporal Laver and Marines Sparks and Mills, took cover in the nearby scrub for a well-earned rest. But their rest was suddenly interrupted when some local fishermen and their wives stumbled across them. Hasler was, to use the old British nautical phrase, between the devil and the deep blue sea. He could either get back on the water in broad daylight and hope they weren't spotted, no. or he could hope that the French wouldn't inform the local gendarmerie. Pleading oh. with them not to say a word, the four British commandos watched the French disappear into the distance. The minutes ticked by. The hours ticked by. Finally, darkness descended on them. The French civilians had kept their promise not to talk. Hurriedly, Hassler and his remaining men pushed their kayaks back out onto the silent Gironde and climbed aboard. That second night was so cold that ice formed on the cockpit covers. Gosh. The following night, they had to paddle against a six-hour ebb tide. In other words, for six out of the nine hours they worked that night, they were going against the tide. In the end, the men and the two cockles were so exhausted that Hassler decided to pull up on an island to rest for the rest of the night and through the next day. They were now running behind schedule, but at least they hadn't been spotted by the Germans. Or had they? I'll tell you in a moment. Uh. On the fourth night, which should have been the night of their attack, the men slowly paddled to a secluded spot close to Bordeaux. There as the daylight broke, and keeping as still and silent as possible, they prepared their limpet mines. The fuses were set for 9pm that night. With his attack force down from six to two boats, Hasler decided that he and Marine Bill Sparks in the Catfish would head to the West Dock, whilst Corporal Laver and Marine Mills would head to the East Dock in the Crayfish. Finally, as dark fell on the night of the 11th of December 1942, they quietly approached the docks. They had less than four hours to get in and get out. Dang. Hasler and Sparks gently paddled into the Western Dock and placed eight mines on four vessels, including a Kriegsmarine patrol boat. Suddenly above them, on the patrol boat, a torch pierced through the darkness towards them. A sentry had chosen the very minute that the catfish was by the anchor chain to check on the surrounding water. The light flashed this way and then that. Surely it was all over. And then as suddenly as the light had appeared, it was switched off. The sentry had done his job. 70 miles from any Royal Navy ships, his patrol boat was safe here in Bordeaux. Yeah, he didn't Meanwhile, look very over in the East Sounds Dock, like... Laver and Mills in Crayfish made for a cargo ship, the Tannenfeld. The Tannenfeld was a celebrated blockade runner, launched in 1938. In 1941, she had found herself on the east coast of Africa in the Italian colony of Somalia, or Somaliland as it was called at the time, when the British invaded. In an effort to escape capture, she had set out on an epic escape journey, travelling all the way down the east coast of Africa to the Cape of Good Hope, and then steaming up the entire Atlantic, evading Royal Navy patrols, to arrive here in Bordeaux. Now the commandos placed five limpet mines on the hull of the blockade runner, and they used their remaining three mines on a small liner moored nearby. Now both crews swiftly made their way out of the docks and back down the Gironde, meeting up on a nearby island. In the distance, they could hear muffled explosions. Oh, shit. Operation Frankton had been a success. Yeah. Exactly how successful they didn't know. They had bigger things to worry about, like get getting there. back to Britain. <laughs> The plan had always been to make their way overland to the Pyrenees and cross into neutral Spain before making for the safety of British Gibraltar. Sometime after 6am the morning after the attack, the two crews scuttled their Cockle Mark II kayaks about 100 yards or metres from each other on the south bank of the Gironde, and then separately struck out for Spain. 
Only Hasler and Sparks were to make it. Back in Britain, Combined Ops and the remaining men of the Royal Marine Boom Patrol Detachment waited for news. The very first news that Mountbatten received was actually via an intercepted German military communique on the 10th of December, over 24 hours before the attack in the docks. The Germans reported that they had captured a British sabotage squad near the mouth of the Gironde. Not that Mountbatten knew that, but it was Sergeant Wallace and Marine Ewart who had disappeared on the opening night in the Coalfish. After four days on the run, oh. Lieutenant McKinnon and Marine Conway had also been captured. And the final haul for the Germans were Corporal Laver and Marine Mills, who had scuttled the crayfish on the morning following the attack and were now making their way towards the mountainous border with Spain. Earlier that year, following a British commando raid on the Channel Island of Sark, some Germans, having surrendered, were shot whilst tied up. Now, whether it was by accident or design, is hotly debated. Hitler chose to believe it was by design and therefore issued in retaliation, oh, issued no. an order that any British commandos captured in the future, whether in uniform or not, were to be executed. Does anybody know about the, the, the incident he's talking about and shed some light on that? I, I don't know anything about that. Um, yeah, that's not good for these guys if if you get captured now i imagine a lot of these guys are thinking that's probably the end result if you got captured anyway regardless of what had happened before but so only a pair one boat a pair two out of 12 um, made it now luckily two out of 10 really because two stayed on board the tuna um hms tuna um, so two out of 10 who started the mission made it to, uh, Gibraltar. Dang. Yeah. I was wondering what had happened to the one they'd lost, uh, contact with at the beginning. So they were, they made it to shore, were captured. The ones that capsized and were towed to shore by Hasler, uh, they were captured and then, uh, Mills and the other chap were captured after. So, oh, man. Mm. And thus it was that Cockleshell heroes, Lieutenant McKinnon, Sergeant Wallace, Corporal Labour, and Marines Mills, Conway, and Ewart were executed. That sucks. You might be doing your sums and have noticed that if six men were executed and two men escaped, that leaves two men outstanding. And you're right, Corporal Sheard and Marine Moffat, whose kayak, Conga, had capsized on the first night. Wait a minute. They swam to the shore, but died of hypothermia. In late February 19... I'm confused. So there were six guys. There was the two that got lost. The two that capsized, now he's saying died of hypothermia when they swam to the shore. Is that the same two that were towed by this guy here, Hasler, and swam the rest of the way? Or is this another two? That's three boats, four. Oh, right, 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 right. So I am was missing two. Oh, God. That sucks. 1943, Combined Operations Headquarters finally received a message from the French resistance informing them that after three months on the run, Hasler and Sparks were safe and well. The message came from Mary Lindell, a British World War I nurse who had married a Frenchman. And now with the code name Marie Claire, she ran an underground network that helped over 100 Allied airmen escape to safety. Afterwards, Bill Sparks, a tough Londoner from Clerkenwell, recalled with amusement Captain Hasler being ordered around by this small, feisty lady. She might have been half the size of Hasler, but as Sparks record, there was no doubt that she was the governor. Huh. Both men were spirited across the border and eventually arrived back in Britain. Hazler was awarded the Distinguished Service Order, the DSO, and Sparks the Distinguished Service Medal. Laver and Mills were posthumously mentioned in dispatches. Operation Frankton, the attack on the docks at Bordeaux by the Cockleshell heroes, 
resulted in at least three German ships being put out of action. Included in these casualties was the blockade breaker, Tannenfels, which was so badly damaged that the That's Germans decided that her best right future there. lay yeah. as a block ship, and so scuttled her in the Gironde in 1944. Yeah. Operation Frankton could have been more damaging if there had been more joined up thinking in the British military. In 2011, former MP and Special Boat Service Officer Paddy Ashdown shed light on this floor. According to Ashdown in a Time Watch documentary, unbeknownst to combined operations, the Special Operations Executive, SOE, were also planning an attack on the docks. Their plan was to infiltrate from the land and place explosives on the ships. The SOE sabotage attack was being coordinated by a Mauritian, Claude de Bessac. Now, here's a little piece of information from World War II, which you might like. Mauritius was a French colony in the Indian Ocean, captured by the British during the Napoleonic Wars. So for 130 years, the inhabitants were British subjects, but like mm. de Bessac, spoke French, and were thus ideal candidates to work as agents sure. in German-occupied France. Over a dozen Mauritians served as SOE operatives in France during World War II, which is not a bad contribution from a tiny island with a population of less than 500,000 at the time. It's intriguing to wonder what might have happened if the Mauritian and Hasler had coordinated their efforts, but it was not to be. Although, as a result of this missed opportunity, the two organisations did share plans for the rest of the war. Herbert Blondie Hasler rose to the rank of Lieutenant Colonel. After the war, he continued his passion for small marine craft and became an accomplished single-handed or solo yachtsman. In 1960, he participated in the Plymouth to New York solo Atlantic race, finishing runner-up to Sir Francis Chichester. That's pretty he good. died in Glasgow in 1987, aged 83. The other survivor from the nice. actual attack, Marine Bill Sparks, became a bus driver and then a conductor in Essex. He also served in the police during the Malaya emergency. He eventually retired to East Sussex, where he died in 2002. Wow. Back in the 1950s, Sparks had also served as an advisor on the film, The Cockleshell Heroes. <laughs> Which neatly brings me back to the film that started my quest and this story. No, it's not like the real events of Operation Frankton. <laughs> For a start, all the names are changed. Sure. There is some love interest in the film as well. Of course. But what it does do is pay homage to these brave men and it keeps their memory and their brave mission alive when so many others have faded from memory. After all, it was because I was talking to those men after that split talk about uh, the film itself that I've ended up making this video about the real events. In 2015, a memorial to the Cockleshell Heroes was unveiled at the National Arboretum in Staffordshire. That's cool. The Cachalot. The Cockle Mark II that was damaged beyond repair on board HMS Tuna on that opening night of the operation That's was returned size. to Britain and somehow Dang. ended up in the warehouse at Surrow where she'd been built. And years later, she was discovered and repaired and now you can see the only surviving Cockleshell Hero boat at the Combined Military Services Museum at Malden in Essex. Operation Frankton was a costly raid. Eight of the ten men who left HMS Tuna were lost. Militarily and strategically, its results are questionable. <laughs> but what is undisputed is the bravery of the men involved. Oh, no doubt. As Admiral Lord Louis Mountbatten said, of the brave and dashing raids carried out by the men of the Combined Operations Command, none was more courageous or imaginative than Operation Frankton. So next time you watch the film, remember those real, brave cockleshell heroes. Well, thanks for watching and I hope you enjoyed it. Whilst I try to get my stories historically accurate, I also try to bring history to life. So, what stories from either British or British military history would you like to hear about in the future? Drop me a line in the comments below. And if you haven't already, please do subscribe to my channel so you don't miss future videos. Maybe even become a member. Click on the buttons below. Thanks for joining me today. Keep well, and I'll see you again very soon. Thank you, Chris. Yeah. Become a member. You get emails, tell you what's coming up, you know, all kinds of stuff. So uh, it's free to do it. So please go support Chris and his channel. It's amazing. Uh, links will be in the description, as always, for the channel and the 
video that we just watched. I learned a lot. I, um, I hadn't seen the film, like I mentioned. Uh, maybe one day I will. But it, the, the true story, of course, is always going to be just... Of course, they had to add a love story. Movies are going to movie. What is just how it is. Um, just be thankful. Yes, the movie is not really accurate, he was saying. But, um, I mean, at least they didn't put Americans in it and make it sound like Americans did this. Right? That always seems to happen. Uh, I'm glad they didn't. <laughs> um, but, yeah, pretty amazing story. And nothing ever goes right when you plan a plan a deal. Yeah, imagine if they did, uh, the SOE and the S SBS were talking and they'd say, hey, we got a plan that, hey, we got a similar plan. Well, maybe coordinate, cause more damage, I don't know. Did this affect anything, the, the, the three ships that were damaged and rendered useless? And it probably cost that guy with the big searchlight, probably cost him his job. Um, Probably had to spend more uh, money and, and men and resources on uh, protecting Bordeaux. So that could have helped a little bit. But it's just so wild. In the grand scheme of, we'll just use World War II as an example, but pretty much any war through history, there are all these little stories of, and let, let me just say right now, war is awful. It's terrible. Don't want it to happen at all. But in the course of the wars, any of these wars that we've had in history, there's always these little stories of bravery and and just craziness and love, even love, um, missions that nearly fail, but for just stroke of luck, succeed or, you know, just char the characters that were involved in these uh, events it's just remarkable and that's what i love learning about world war ii and others is all these little pieces that are so numerous you know you could do a movie on an event from world war ii that you could fill up the whole calendar and have it have a new one come out every weekend or more you know it's just there's so many of these stories it's wild wow that was good I hope you enjoyed that. Um, you'll have to let me know what you think of the movie, if you care to. I will get around to it at some point. I will. Um, but, yeah, main thing is go support Chris and uh, do the things you guys do over on his channel. Hope everybody's happy, healthy, and safe. Thanks so much for coming. This was a lot of fun, and we'll see you in the next one. Take care. All right. Bye. Walk from the stage. It's Mark from the States, it's Mark, and he's from...